the door was being incessantly knocked. He wondered who the lunatic was doing that, especially so early in the morning. Still sleepy and rubbing his eyes, he opened the door and found a man standing in front of him, staring at him. Ronan asked, Who are you? Beggars are not allowed here. The man frowned disapprovingly at Ronan's behavior. What a rude boy, he said irritated. Do you realize whom you're being rude to right now? Ronan still seemed dazed from the abrupt awakening and replied, I don't know. Well, you seem to be a noble. Pausing for a moment, his mind completed his speech because besides being a nobly, the aura he emanated was dark to the point of seeming very strange. There was something mixed in his aura, and Ronan wondered if this could be real, as everything felt strangely familiar. All his thoughts were interrupted when someone touched the man next to the boy, saying, Wait, Dolan, we're not in a position to act like this. Young Dolan turned to respond and addressed the man as, Your Grace, leaving Ronan perplexed, wondering if this was the Duke of this empire. The man ended up apologizing to our protagonist for the way his knight had acted. In a much more cordial manner, he said, If it's not too much to ask, could you spare us some of your time? This was Duke Grancia. They were both seated, and it seemed they had already had a long conversation. Ronan opened a box and said, So, according to what you said, this is the sheath from La Mancha, which was completed yesterday. He was observing a thin silver sword sheath with golden emblems. A bit embarrassed, Ronan asked Duke Grancia why he had brought it for him. It turns out that the master blacksmiths of the great Carpadoki had insisted a lot, especially Master Daron, and upon remembering this, the Duke emphasized how insistent he could be. The Duke continued, Furthermore, I wanted to express my personal gratitude. The Grancia family and the great Carpadoki have an excellent relationship. He looked at his own sword and added, My sword, Pale Path, was also crafted by Master Daron, and as a way to show gratitude for the hero who saved Carpadoki, it seemed like a good idea to bring this here. Then, he reached into his pocket and said he had prepared another thing in return, pulling out a shining golden coin. Ronan was astonished and exclaimed, I, is this a Grancia medallion? A gran the medallion bore the symbol of a dragon in the center, representing the patriarchal seal. Ronan took the medallion, asking why the duke would be giving something so precious as with it, he could buy three villages. However, the duke believed it was fair to offer it to the savior, in the name of Grancia Honor. He explained that it wasn't just Ronan receiving something. The two students who helped him, Maria and Asil, also received gifts from the master blacksmiths, in addition to the medallion, and they hoped they liked them. A bit embarrassed, Ronan commented, they will treat this as a family heirloom. Upon hearing this, the duke felt relieved. He set down the teacup he was drinking on the table and completely changed the subject. Crossing his arms and adopting a more serious posture, he asked, Ronan, can you tell me about the one behind the incidents? I became interested in these nefarious individuals. Upon hearing this, Ronan instantly sensed the intensity emanating from the Duke and was momentarily taken aback. However, he soon burst into laughter upon recognizing the familiar intensity. Behind the Duke, there was an aura of light shining in his eyes, and a thought occurred to Ronan. Is this the leader of the Grancia family? Ronan wasn't sure how much the Duke knew, but these individuals were more formidable than the Duke could imagine. Upon hearing this, Dolan couldn't hide a certain contempt in his expressions, and a unique atmosphere began to linger, as Ronan explained that they were also quite agile, and that he had spent a long time pursuing them. When Ronan was about to reveal what he had discovered, he saw several stars appear along with this sensation, and at that moment asked himself, but what is this? He looked at Dolan, who still maintained his fixed gaze and continued to think, he hasn't reacted until now. Has he noticed my mention? And thinking about it, this feeling is similar to what I felt when I was fighting those two. Could it be that he... Ronan stopped talking for a moment, suspicious that Dolan might be the enemy, and this pause was also noticed by the Count, who asked our protagonist what was happening for him to stop speaking so suddenly. Ronan observed the Count's reaction to his pause and questioned, What kind of reaction is this? Doesn't he realize that his subordinate is emitting this? The Duke seemed oblivious to what was happening around him and asked if our protagonist was feeling uncomfortable. This made Ronan realize that despite the Duke being the most powerful person on the continent, he couldn't see all these bright stars around him. In other words, 
Ronan was the only one capable of seeing them. He then composed himself and asked, Your Grace, have you heard about the advent of the star? Upon mentioning the advent, Dolan's expression changed completely, revealing accumulated anger. The Duke then mentioned, Does it have something to do with that nebula classier organization composed of star children? I can hardly believe that such an organization exists on the continent. However, the Duke's question was how Ronan had obtained this information on his own. Ronan explained, Yes, before the instructor arrived, I tortured them by cutting off their arms and legs until they started talking. Seeing those idiots begging for mercy was hilarious. He began wiping tears of laughter as the Duke informed. I'll confirm the rest with Lodoland's interrogator then. If I hear more now, I won't be able to eat. Ronan leaned back on the sofa, smirking, saying he wouldn't say anything more if that was the Duke's wish. But his expression changed drastically when he realized he had already said enough. He observed Dolan desperately trying to control himself, his eyes burning with fury. The Duke then stood up, saying he was leaving. Ronan sensed the urgency of taking action, as these people had infiltrated Grancia. He also stood up and said, There's something you need to know about them. Pretending to be embarrassed, he added, There are many things to discuss, and it wouldn't be polite to talk about it with someone as busy as you. But I'll write a report on the matter and send it to you. Both guests were a bit surprised when Ronan mentioned that the report would be quite interesting. Ronan was testing the limits of Dolan's patience when he spoke intensely, it will be especially interesting because of a Hayute. This information left Dolan completely shocked. On that same night, Ronan slept peacefully, drooling on the bed without any worries. Suddenly, a familiar sensation and a starry aura began to approach him. All at once, a purple sword cut through the air toward Ronan's neck, but an explosion of light occurred and debris flew around, leaving Dolan completely stunned, not understanding what had happened. What? He disappeared? exclaimed Dolan, alarmed as he hit a rock. At the same time, Ronan's voice came from behind him saying, I knew you would come tonight. Our protagonist stood, ready to attack with his feet as he continued. It's a pleasure, rat number three. At that moment, Dolan was alarmed, asking how Ronan knew, but our protagonist asked for calm without realizing that someone had landed in the same spot. Ronan pointed to a third guy who was in the room, saying, Maybe you want to take a look there first, because I brought a special guest just for you. It was young Master Schlieffen, glaring at Dolan with an intense and angry look. The master then spoke. Explain yourself, Dolan. How should I interpret this situation? A few hours before the incident, Ronan was in the upper floor hall of the Naberdozer dormitory, talking with one of the academy students, who was Schlieffen. Upon Ronan's sudden visit, Schlieffen questioned the reason for his surprise. Ronan then said, are you telling me Sir Dolan is going to ambush you tonight? Schlieffen, incredulous, grabbed his sword. This makes no sense. Do you have any proof? Sir Dolan was known for his skill and loyalty, being one of Grancia's top knights and the Duke's guardian four years after becoming a knight. Faced with such reputation, Schlieffen questioned Ronan. So why would he attack you without reason? Ronan ironically replied, Four years? The Grancias are incompetent, huh? Stunned by Ronan's offensive comment, Schlieffen was left speechless, watching Ronan turn his back and say, Whatever, come see for yourself. It's not like you have anything to lose. Ronan paused for a moment, looked back, and added, Now, if I'm right, you'll be getting rid of a rat infiltrating your family. In the present moments, a sword was raised, and young Schlieffen pointed it at Dolan, saying with a tone full of anger, Didn't you hear me? I told you to explain yourself, Dolan. However, the young man remained silent, frowning until a sharp cry from the young master urged him to respond. Answer. Ronan seemed pleased with this development and laughed, adding fuel to the fire. What kind of traitor only answers because he was questioned? How do you plan to survive in this world? You're so naive, Ronan commented. Dolan lifted his foot and struck firmly on the ground, causing a mana explosion that traversed the entire floor. This action left both Schlieffen and Ronan perplexed. Shortly afterward, our protagonist looked at his hands, which began to be surrounded by this mana, and thought, My body is getting heavy. Is this his mana? It didn't take long for Ronan to notice something coming toward him and quickly dodge Dolan's attack, but not fast enough to avoid being pushed to the ground. Schlieffen then shouted, Dolan, 
why are you doing this? And as he drew the attention of the knight from his family, Dolan ran toward him, wielding his sword. As he approached, he struck, but Schlieffen managed to evade with difficulty. Dolan stared at him sternly and said, It's fortunate that you haven't mastered control over your mana yet, young master. Considering your personality, you wouldn't use a violent ability that could harm people. Schlieffen gritted his teeth, angered, tightly gripping his sword, surrounded by mana, and blocked his knight's strike, both of them starting to lock eyes. Dolan continued, I didn't want our relationship to end like this. That child ruined everything. Frustrated with what was happening, Schlieffen noticed that his knight's abilities were different from what he remembered. Upset, he took a deep breath and said, Have you been hiding your abilities? Since when? Why are you betraying... What no one expected was Dolan to be offended by the word betraying. The swords clashed against each other, and, completely enraged, he declared, I never... I've been by your side from the start. Schlieffen stood still after this revelation, disappointed. He didn't move as Dolan advanced toward him again. Astonished, he spoke that he understood. The gleam on his face gave way to the dullness of disappointment. I get it now. Do as you please. So Ronan stepped between the two and held the blow given by Dolan, which was aimed at the young master. Without understanding how, Dolan trembled, not comprehending what had just happened. Ronan looked at the still paralyzed Schlieffen, finding it all too annoying, as if the young master enjoyed seeing him irritated. Our protagonist then asked, Feeling better now? In response, Schlieffen said, It was important for me to make sure. I hope you understand. He then put his hand on Ronan's shoulder, pushing him with a thirst for vengeance and said, For a while, there will be bloodshed in Grancia. And he retaliated. Quickly, Schlieffen was ahead of Dolan, surprising him. Dolan couldn't understand how he had advanced so rapidly, how he had withstood his mana at full strength and still held the mana blade just with his own energy. Schlieffen delivered a swift blow that sent Dolan flying backward. Now, the traitorous knight, being attacked directly, began to suspect that the young master might also be hiding his abilities, but quickly corrected himself, as there was no reason for Schlieffen to do so. He stared at him and thought, Does that mean he became so strong in such a short time? No, that's impossible. I know he's a genius, but what kind of... His thoughts were abruptly interrupted when Ronan attacked him, asking if he was bored. Dolan sensed our protagonist's approach, but still seemed lost in his own thoughts. Ronan's attack was blocked at the last moment, completely pulling him out of distraction. The clash of the swords produced intense light, and the only thing Dolan could think was, Damn, he's as strong as... Even under the pressure exerted by Ronan, Dolan managed to dodge, and that attack was so powerful that the ground cracked, sending several rocks flying through the air. Our protagonist was startled to see that Dolan had managed to evade it, and suddenly a kick was delivered against him, throwing him backward as Ronan cursed. The traitorous knight was concerned about the noise and commotion, as if it continued like this. The teachers would show up, so he decided to retreat. Noticing a window... He ran towards it. As he ran desperately, he thought, Hell! I didn't expect things to go so wrong just by trying to kill a child. It was a mistake to think I could defeat both of them at the same time. I need to hide and wait for another opportunity to finish him off. In this attempt to escape, Dolan didn't expect to see Schlieffen emerge above him, glowing in the light, wielding a sword while delivering his speech. You're right, Dolan. Unlike my father... I'm not yet as skilled. I can't wield the tempestuous sword correctly. However, you chose this path. Knowing this, how foolish. Everything around began to move, various leaves flying in the increasingly furious wind, while Schlieffen continued, There's no one here who will be harmed if I use the tempestuous sword, except you, the traitor I need to eliminate. Schlieffen then invoked the secret technique of the Grancia family, the Stormy Sword. From it emerged a wind forming a hurricane and advancing towards Dolan. He armed himself with a trembling voice and cursed, trying desperately to restrain this ability. However, the wind was relentless and gradually began to cut Dolan's skin. Faced with imminent death, he had his final thoughts. Ah, my dear star. Then the hurricane struck him. Schlieffen sheathed his sword and standing before Dolan's lifeless body said, From today onwards, 
No one in the family will remember who you are, but I'm sure that doesn't matter. After all, you were never a Grantia. Not long after, Ronan found Schlieffen, pointing out that he had dealt with the situation quite conspicuously, but the young master's expression was unfriendly. Smirking with irony, Ronan said, You seem upset, but considering the state he's in, I'm not sure we can take him to Lodalan. However, Schlieffen asked him not to worry, as the man wouldn't die. All he had done was cut his tendons theoretically, leaving Ronan astonished. Schlieffen trusted that with Ronan present, everything would be fine, as he needed to inform his family about it. But his anger was visible, and with an intense gaze he said, We need to find all the traitors. Without wasting any more time, he ran off, leaving everything in Ronan's hands, while our protagonist wondered, Hey, how can he just leave like that? Not very satisfied, he shouted, You destroyed everything here, so why are you leaving everything to me? He didn't even notice the gate opening behind him, continuing to shout, What kind of headless idiot? Until he heard someone calling him by name, with a sword drawn, asking what had happened and if he had really been ambushed. Ronan turned around surprised, as both the director and instructor Nabiros were there. By the way, what a lovely pajama she had. Watch out for the snake! Of course, this pajama made Ronan completely uncomfortable. Now I don't know if it was because of the snake or seeing her in pajamas, but in the end, he became radiant and animatedly signaled that he loved her pajamas. While Ronan was enchanted with her pajamas, she, in a curt and concerned manner, only asked him to answer the question, followed by confirmation from the director saying, Your instructor's taste in pajamas is not important right now, even though it is surprising. It's a relief that you're not hurt. But can you explain? Ronan animatedly looked at the still figure on the ground and said he could explain, but he wanted to be heard before anything else. What do you have to say, Ronan? The director asked. Then, with a furious tone, he exclaimed, Ahayute, son of a expletive. The professor was surprised by the curse, while Nabarose, incredulous, uttered a, Ah, that? Silence hung over them until the professor exclaimed Ahayute's name and the curse that followed. The next day, in the director's office, he was attentively listening to the whole story about the presence of spies in the Grancia family, emphasizing that it was a much worse problem than anyone had thought. Nonetheless, the director praised our protagonist for the excellent service and revealed that, thanks to him, they had managed to prevent something more significant from happening. Awkwardly, Ronan scratched his head, informing that he didn't need so much praise in that manner. Finally, he wanted to keep the fact that he could see that special mana a secret for now because he wasn't sure about it. Moreover, if the information leaked, not only he but everyone around him would be in great danger. The director wanted this incident to be investigated soon on a large scale, with Grancia at its center, so there was nothing to worry about. The director smiled and said, Our empire is constantly in your debt. Since the situation with the blacksmiths, I want to reward you accordingly as a director. Is there anything you desire? Our protagonist smiled happily, finding the idea great, and very excitedly revealed. There's something I wanted to do at school. Can you approve that? The director was concerned because he needed approval and was curious to know what it was. The next day, in the Grand Hall of Fillion, Ronan stood in front of a class, showing something on the board and saying, Listen up, everyone. Activities where you have to spend the whole day at school. Tired of that? Tapping on the notice board, he continued, I've created something for you. It's called the Special Adventures Club. One of the students tried to ask what it was, but Ronan quickly put his finger on the student's mouth, silencing him, and affirmed that it was a good question. So what is a Special Adventures Club? Energetically, Ronan explained, It's a purely constructive club, with external activities focused on real battles. To make our talents flourish. With the director's approval, this is the only club that can happen. He looked like a proud god of his achievement. The students were a bit confused by the term, the only club that can happen. But he continued explaining, For those who want to join, show up at the first Galelian Arena during the scheduled times. As he delivered his speeches joyfully and thanked all the interested individuals, someone in the distance observed him. The girl sighed, saying, No way. Is it this guy? She seemed to recognize Ronan and that manic, sick expression from somewhere. 
A few days later, in Galelian, the joy seemed to have disappeared from Ronan's face as he questioned, Why? Our protagonist sat in the arena, holding his sword seriously, and exclaimed, I put on that whole show in the hall, trying to recruit new talents, so why only you guys showed up here after yesterday? In front of him were his usual friends, Maria and Acel. Maria smiled and asked if he really didn't know why, urging him to reflect on the past interviews. He had claimed it was a skill check, but in reality, he had faced all the candidates, and for those who managed to stay, he had said suspicious things like, Are you prepared to sacrifice yourself for the club? Acel, a bit embarrassed, revealed that he had heard rumors that quickly spread throughout the school, saying that to join this club, you would need at least ten lives. Our protagonist wasn't pleased with that, asserting, Real fights like that. They don't have the courage? But whatever. What he really needed was promising people. Ronan looked back where something caught his attention. Near them, a young student struggled in his personal training, kneeling and gasping for breath. Then, Ronan approached and asked, Feeling better now? I told you there was no need to show your skills, but you insisted on fighting. The guy wiped the sweat, and it was evident that he had undergone considerable effort. This man, pleased with his accomplishment, was Braum, who thanked Ronan with a smile. In response, Ronan said, Let me tell you now, our club can be exhausting. Are you sure about this, Braum? The young man, with a beaming smile, affirmed that this was exactly what he had been waiting for. He wanted to become even stronger. Then, Ronan returned to his friends, saying they needed to go now and rest before everything started. But Acel, concerned, wanted to know what he would do. Ronan wanted to stay there, as he still had some time. Perhaps a talented individual might appear. Ronan's hope dwindled as night fell, and he slumped on the table, disheartened, murmuring about why no one had shown up. Adishan stood up with the intention of leaving at that moment, and immediately Ronan thanked her, saying, You must be busy as the instructor's assistant, but you came when you had time. She responded with a smile, and said it was a pity. If it weren't for her duties as an assistant, she would have joined herself. Ronan's expression changed completely. He couldn't bring himself to say that even if she tried, he wouldn't have accepted. But he still watched her doing things and thought, she needs to slowly decide whether or not she will give up on her dream of being a great commander. Well, it's an important issue, so she needs to think about it seriously. Suddenly, a girl appeared with a red hood, saying, Phew, you're still here? Both were surprised by her presence, but Ronan quickly composed himself, and with a smile on his face again, asked, Did you come for the interview? Are you trying to join our club? The girl, not understanding anything, spoke softly, almost whispering. Club? Can I do that? Ronan couldn't understand what she had said and asked her to repeat. Then, she started taking off her hood and said, If I join your club, I'll be able to play. It became a bit ambiguous what she really wanted, so our protagonist, trying to understand, repeated, Touch it? Suddenly, a dirty thought crossed his mind, and desperate, he defended himself, saying, what shameless thing are you saying? But in response, the girl explained that she didn't want to touch him, but rather, the creature on her shoulder, i.e., Tsita, who let out a Q. Ronan affectionately petted his friend, saying she should have said that from the beginning, and then he wouldn't have misunderstood. He further explained that this little one is always with him, so if she joins the club, she will surely be able to touch her. Astonished, the girl trembled at this possibility making our protagonist think how strange this person was. He couldn't believe he didn't sense her presence despite the proximity, and surely she is not an ordinary student. Now that he could feel her, he knew she was very strong. The girl pondered for a moment, and then asked what she needed for the interview. Quickly, Ronan pointed to a dummy in the area and asked her to demonstrate the techniques she had with that magical engineering dummy, and also requested her level and name. Activating her abilities... She began emanating a purple energy. She said, I'm a high-level beginner magi Ophelia the night. Concentrating mana in her hands, ready to start. In an instant, her eyes were engulfed in the energy of her mana, and her whole body glowed purple. This change in the scenery surprised both, until Adishan tried to say, I is this? Dark attribute magic? 
Several lines of purple mana traversed the environment as she demonstrated, and with each passing moment, Adishan found her ability to control dark mana so perfectly incredible. But for our protagonist, there was something even more surprising, though not very clear. Observing the girl closely, he thought, the red blood energy emanating from the center of mana. Her hands were being enveloped by this energy like smoke coming out of her hands and extending to Sita, who instantly became still and prepared. Then, Ronan realized that everything she was doing and her stance could only be one thing. The girl said, Shadow Claw. This mana in the form of claws surged towards the dummy, and upon hitting it, it made a burst of lights, sending it backward instantly. The impact was so strong that even some stones loosened and were scattered in the air, raising dust. Ronan and Adishan, who were watching, were surprised and even had to protect themselves from the smoke and light that were raised. The only thing Ronan managed to say upon seeing everything was, We don't need a duel. You've passed. But Ronan's curiosity wouldn't let him rest until he finally spoke. But Ophelia? You? He fell silent when her thoughts were shared with him, asking if he had seen. That's when he realized it was telepathic magic. As she put her hood back on, she shared her thoughts again, asking him to keep it to himself for now because if other people find out, it will be too annoying. Then she suggested they go somewhere else because there was something she needed to ask. After some time, they were walking together, Ophelia holding Sita. Petting her, she said, I understand. So this is a dream bird, a bird born from the mana contained in the area. Interesting. However, for Ronan, she was just as interesting as him. So he said, I heard that all of you left the empire a long time ago. She looked at them with eyes as red as Sita's, and under the night's light, he referred to her as a vampire. Her eyes became more immersive, as if she were recalling everything they had been through when she explained, not all of us left. Even if few, there are still some of us in the empire. But we don't like tiresome things, so we live hidden. Ronan couldn't understand why she would approach the club seeking things completely different from what she did until, seeing her interact with her little creature, he thought, Sita's mana? To which she undoubtedly confirmed yes. She explained that she sensed it when she first saw him in the hall. She felt the energy of blood magic, which was the innate magic of her kind. Ronan then, looking at Sita, said, I was thinking, I get it. So, Sita really uses vampire abilities. Well, the first thing you did when you were born was absorb blood, so it would be strange if it weren't true. Upon hearing this account, the girl was surprised, turned to Ronan, asking if this was serious, unable to believe that she was born like that and able to use this magic. Disbelieving, she asked, How long has it been since she was born? Three years? No, it must be at least five years, right? A bit awkwardly, he replied that, actually, Sita should be only two months old, leaving the girl even more shocked. No way, only two months? But she already has such dense blood mana? Seeming a bit more excited, her expression had completely changed. If that's true. Ah, uh, it might be possible. Then, she asked if she could ask something from the two. But Ronan found it strange because, why would she be suddenly asking something from him? Then, with a puppy-eyed look, she said, I just wanted to see her for a moment, but if I complete my request, I'll make it worthwhile. Of course, I'll start the research right away so it will be difficult in the meantime. But later, I promise. All of this left Ronan even more confused, especially with the mention of research. So he asked, What research? The next day, in the club areas of Fillion, there was a not-so-exaggerated place that looked like a church and in this place was the Special Adventures Club. Everyone was outside, observing the grand structure they had acquired. Ronan looked happily, recognizing the generosity of dedicating an entire building to the club, but soon turned to his friends and changed the subject when he realized something had changed in them. He referred to the weapons they were carrying and asked if they were the weapons from the great Cappadoki that the Grancia sent, to which Maria immediately replied, Yes. Maria had switched to a large sword, and holding her new weapon, she said, The great commander made a sword that will maximize my strength, so I decided to give it a try. Akel, in turn, happy and enthusiastic, mentioned, I, I received a magical bracelet. It's made near the magical city of Delpium, 
and since its magical control is much better, I think my power and speed have doubled. They had indeed received incredible weapons. Maria was uncertain about their meeting today. Ronan had asked everyone to come armed, but our protagonist turned around, warning that everyone would find out once they entered. Opening the door, he paused for a moment, looked at them sideways, and said, This is a very important conversation. After some time, everyone had entered the place and gathered at a table where Ronan said, You must be curious to know why I created a club like this, but we have only one goal. Improve our latent individual skills as quickly as possible through real experiences. Look at Dumbledore's Army version 3.0 forming. Ronan's expression changed drastically. He seemed serious, and his gaze was quite intense as if he had already lived through all that preparation on a future day. He pointed on a map, saying, The first place we're going to is this. One of the mountain ranges still undiscovered by the Empire. The Vadian Mountains. The three instantly became alarmed at the thought of a mountain range. But Ronan assured them that, as everyone knows, that place was quite unusual, so it would be a good experience for all. He picked up the sword and began to rise, explaining that he also had business to attend to there. However, that wasn't the most important thing now because first, there was an issue between Acel and Maria that needed to be resolved. Both were surprised and exclaimed, Us? Maria confused, asked what this problem was. However, Ronan asserted, It doesn't matter. All of you, let's go now. And with a smile on his face, a strong desire, and all excited, he concluded that meeting by saying, Let's fight. Your friends were curious and wouldn't leave you alone, asking constantly, What did you say, Ronan? As they walked down a long hallway, Asel seemed anxious, wanting to know what the big issue he had mentioned in the meeting was. Ronan had said that it was necessary for everyone to finish their modules earlier. He turned around and asked, Why are you all shocked? It's obvious. If we leave, it'll take at least a week. But you still have classes. He pointed out that Barum had already finished several of his modules early, so it doesn't matter to him. It will be difficult to juggle club activities and classes. There's no way the principal will allow that, Ronan said as his friends stared at him. Asel, wanting to argue, couldn't deny that it was true, but there was always a but. Ronan interrupted him, asking what the solution would be. But soon, with a radiant smile, he answered the question as if it wasn't a hindrance at all. Finish your classes early, just like me, and become free. It wasn't long before they were on the second floor of the club hall, the training room. Ronan warned us that before continuing individual training, he wanted to see their skills. Ronan showed confidence when he urged them to attack him, saying he would only use the sheath of his sword so they didn't need to fear, but he grimaced as he said, but it won't be fun if you hold back, so come at me full force. Got it? Akel tensed up when he saw his friend make that face, but it was Maria who ironically commented that it was so reassuring for them. She looked at Acel, saying they had no choices, and thus suggested they try that, calling it fluffy, and stating that they should show him how much they had improved. Acel, excitedly but with a bit of apprehension, understood what she meant and then focused his magic into his hands, saying he would do his best. Maria, on the other hand, grabbed her massive sword and let her aura flow around her. With a swift movement, she raised her sword high, and as she drove it into the ground, she marked the beginning of that day's training. The sword hit the ground, causing various frictions and a strong dust cloud all around. Ronan, pleased with Maria's strength, found everything amazing, but couldn't understand why she had hit the ground until he started to see the stones getting entangled in Akel's magic. They floated, enveloped in his mana, and as if he could control all the debris caused by his friend's sword, he said, Let's begin, Maria. The stones began to shoot off in all directions, but their central focus was Ronan, who was surprised to see them coming his way. However, skillfully, our protagonist managed to dodge them all while acknowledging, Has your telekinesis improved that much? The stones kept coming at him nonstop, and then he began using his sword to help him combat some of them, finding Ossel's evolution truly impressive. In the next moment, something caught Ronan's attention. He was facing Maria, who was raising her sword, her eyes gleaming with the green of her aura. She was above him and certain she could reach him, saying, Don't try to block, just dodge. Maria's weapon glowed green as it prepared to strike him with full force. As she approached Ronan with her sword, she ended up hitting the ground again because he had managed to dodge. 
Ronan seemed to be having fun, maintaining a smile on his face, admiring his friend's attack and thinking that if he hadn't dodged, he would have died. The weapon had created a fairly large crater in the ground, from which various debris were released and an aura explosion was seen. Maria's expression was grim, and her eyes shone with a green light. She swung her sword again, grazing Ronan's neck. In the next moment, Ronan planted his feet on the ground with a thrust that caught his friend's attention, putting her on alert, yet his strike still caught her by surprise. She had to block with her sword, with Ronan demanding even more strength from her. She gritted her teeth, trying to endure. These guys have exceeded my expectations anyway, he thought, seeing Asel lifting a huge piece of the ground with magic in one hand and several other small stones in the other. He looked up, where Asel shouted, Maria, get away from Ronan! And thus, several stones flew toward her. Ronan had to leap to evade it, but he quickly recovered, grabbing his sword to use against Acel, who still controlled the stones. Above him, a huge chunk of concrete was about to be released, so he drew his sword entirely and started making several quick cuts, leaving visible trails behind, shattering that piece into several smaller concrete bits. He looked around with a smile, noticing a shower of stones falling around him. The fight caused a dense cloud of smoke in the environment, and Ronan appeared on his knees as some sharp stones pointed toward him. You've really improved a lot. It seems like you weren't kidding while I was away, he said. Asel and Maria were focused, showing Ronan everything they had. He told Excel, You really seem like a different person and I'm quite surprised. The young boy half thanked him and asked if this was the end of the test, to which Ronan affirmed that yes, what he saw was already sufficient. They both relaxed, feeling relieved, and Ronan was sure that a month would be more than enough, or even two weeks. But Ronan prepared again, which made the two look at their hands, and with a sinister smile, he said that now the training would truly begin, leaving them both terrified as they had just dueled. For our protagonist, that didn't matter, as he ran after them, asking them to move. To them, Ronan seemed crazy, and his terrifying expression made them fear and plead for help because none of it seemed right. From that moment on, Acel and Maria began their special training in exchange for their sleep, and two weeks had passed. We see a hand on top of a stack of written papers. Then we see an old man looking at the owner of the hand, mouth agape in surprise. He said, so you're telling me these are the early completion certificates? The hand belonged to Ronan, who along with his companions affirmed that yes, these were certificates for all the club members. He explained that they weren't for all subjects, but he asserted that they were enough to get permission to leave. The director, with a slight chuckle, understood and said that Ronan never ceased to amaze him. The old man clasped his hands together and happily allowed them all to leave the campus, wishing them a safe journey and luck in their adventures. The next day, they embarked on the first destination of the Special Adventure Club activities, heading straight for the Vadian Mountains. At the base of the mountain, Maria raised her hand, feeling a completely pure mana coming from the area, and she was amazed by the sensation. Barum smiled happily, stating that just by sensing that mana, he knew the training would have some kind of effect. He asked Ronan what they would have to do next, but Ronan, who was ahead of them, replied that once they were at the mountain's center, he would make everyone aware of what they would be doing there exactly. The wind at the location was strong, carrying various leaves in a breeze that transitioned to a spot where only Ronan's voice was heard, explaining that first, they would have to find something. All voices reached the spot along with the breeze, catching the ears of a mysterious elf. As they asked what exactly this thing they were supposed to find was, the elf, who could hear even from a distance, realized that he had company, even in a place like that. In a greenish aura, and still with a mysterious expression, the elf declared, I need to welcome my guests. For the first time in a long while, our boys reached the top of a cliff, where Ronan approached it to assess the height. He stood up with a wide smile, exclaiming, I found it. Nearby, there were some orcs peacefully going about their tasks at their camp, and as they approached, they realized there were hundreds of them. Barum remarked that they had built a village, which was incredible, while Ronan explained that in border areas like this, it was hard to maintain public order so things like this could happen. He explained that at this moment, it was just a village, but their fertility was high, so soon they would have enough orcs to cover the entire mountain range, and thus the people nearby would suffer significant losses. So before that happens, we need to deal with them, Ronan asserted, 
turning to the group and declaring that this would be their first battle. Asel began to tremble nervously. He knew Ronan was looking for orcs, so something like this was expected, but even so, there were so many of them. And Asel's concern was whether everything would be okay. Ronan was calm and asked them not to be afraid, as orcs were perfect opponents for them, even though there was one variable that worried him, the dominant species of the mountain range, the ogres. These creatures would be difficult to kill, especially the leader, the two-headed ogre. Ronan remembered how strong he was back then, to the point of being able to kill him. He knew that this leader would appear later, so it shouldn't be a problem now. Ronan stood up, asking them to move slowly, however. Another voice was heard, saying, Your intentions are good, but I don't advise it. O Elf had appeared before the young adventurers, leaving everyone surprised as he explained that now was not a good time for the young adventurers. Ronan quickly turned to see who it was, intrigued because he hadn't sensed his arrival, and upon seeing his species he wondered, but who is this elf? The man in turn smiled, asserting that nobody needed to be on high alert as he was just a priest living in the mountains. A priest? Ronan asked, still suspicious. The elf affirmed it and explained that he served an ancient spirit whose divine name was Senial. With that confirmed, the elf suggested they talk somewhere else as it wasn't safe there. Ronan grabbed his sword and pointed it at the man's neck without a second thought. Maria and Aesil called his attention, asking what he was planning. But Ronan simply apologized, and with a darker expression, explained that there were many lunatics around recently. So he asked the man to listen and repeat what he was going to say. The man was scared and trembling, unsure of what he was going to repeat, until Ronan shouted, Ah, hi, Yute, you son of a bee! The elf was stunned, seeing the sword at his neck, and the only word he managed to utter was, What? After a while, the priest elf was embarrassed because, being a servant of God, it was shameful for him to say such things. He held his own face, burning with shyness, stating that this was the most embarrassing moment of his last two hundred years. Ronan, finding it an exaggeration, asked him to relax because it had been a pretty divine shout. However, what caught Ronan's attention the most was the two hundred years of existence, thinking that the elf was really very old. The elf said it had been a long time since he stopped counting, so he wasn't sure, but he should be in his two thousandth year. The group was shocked by the information and, with a unanimous shout, exclaimed, Two thousand years? Ronan was paralyzed watching the elf messing with one of the plants and thinking that this could indicate that he was alive even before the Empire's foundation. But Ronan himself interrupted his reverie and asked, What were you talking about earlier? About the weather not being good. The elf looked at him and began to explain, The monster's actions have been strange recently. The orcs, who are not nocturnal, walk through the mountains all night, and the ogres, who usually don't leave their territories, have been seen at the mountain range entrance. Some unusual phenomena are happening, and since no one has found the cause, it would be best for everyone to be cautious. The elf reached out and then touched the air, which reacted as if touching still water, saying they needed to relax a bit now. Quickly, everything around the boys changed as if they were entering a transparent capsule, and suddenly the entrance to a grand temple began to appear, and the elf informed them that this was the Temple of Seniel. Barum cheerfully asked, For a temple like this to appear out of nowhere, is it a magical barrier? While Aesil was amazed, Incredible, a magical barrier of this scale, it must be at the level, No, it must even surpass our instructors. The friend quickly asked Ronan, Did you know there was a temple here? Our protagonist seemed not to like this situation very much because his response was a bit rude. Can't you see my surprised face? He looked sternly at the elf, who cheerfully invited them in, knowing he was not just any elf. The temple was indeed very beautiful and bright. They entered until they reached a place where everyone stopped and looked somewhat disappointed. So, the seniel you serve should be this odd stone, Ronan asked, looking at an imposing stone as if it were a bust sculpturi. The elf, enchanted, explained that it was a stone with significance but claimed that the story would be very boring for them, so he suggested they unpack and rest, informing them that the temple had many empty rooms, and if they needed anything, they just had to let him know. Maria was surprised at that moment and took the opportunity to speak to Ronan. It's a good time, didn't you say you were looking for something else? Ask him. Ronan thought for a second and decided to inquire about the habitats of the cursed eyes. 
The elf was surprised by this search and questioned him about why they were looking for this monstrosity until the elf asked, Is this because of the curse on you? Of course, this left our protagonist super suspicious, as well as perplexed. How did you... Ronan tried to ask, but the elf seemed deeply absorbed by his confirmation. Ah, so I was right. I thought it might be the case. Because of the strange and dangerous reverberations within you. He raised his head, looked at him deeply, and asked if he could have a bit of his time because he needed to have a conversation with him. After a while, we are taken to a place where the wind was constant, and Ronan and the elf were sitting having tea. He was saying to our protagonist, I had a feeling since the first time I saw you, I soon realized you were not a normal student. The elf poured a cup of tea while Ronan, embarrassed, just confirmed that he understood. But in his thoughts, he was surprised because he had been swept along by him without even realizing. He tightly gripped his sword and thought, am I being too sensitive? Ronan was more suspicious now, and at this moment, he remembered the other people he had encountered and wondered if the elf really had a connection with them. Ronan began to compare things, recalling the mana of the young man he had faced not long ago and saw no resemblance to the elf. And even when he mentioned the name Ahayuti, the elf showed no expression. The elf finished preparing the tea and placed the teapot on the table, then offered the cup to Ronan, noticing that he was too pensive and that the tea would help him. Ronan took the cup and saw his image reflected in it, wondering if it was safe to drink or if the elf had done something to it. Suddenly, a breeze with a peculiar smell began to emanate from the tea, and upon feeling it, our protagonist thought, What smell is this? I've never felt anything like this before. Soon, it clicked, and Ronan, perplexed, understood that it was the scent of pure mana. Looking at the elf, he noticed various colorful mana streams emanating from him. The man then asked, How does the tea smell? The elf maintained a sinister smile on his face, and with his hands crossed over his face asked, So, did you like it? Ronan was enchanted by the flow of mana coursing through him. Did I like it? It's like I've swapped eyes, he exclaimed. The elf explained that the tea was made with a special herb that rarely grows in this mountain range, and it pierced supplied veins, revitalizing the senses. It's not something you should see the effects of all at once, but perhaps because your energy is blocked by the curse, you'll experience drastic results, Ronan, the elf said. He also mentioned that he would prepare some ingredients for him and suggested that he drink it regularly to improve his condition, and at this point, he made a request. Please stop using the cursed eyes to remove your curse. Ronan was truly surprised and didn't understand why, so the elf explained, Even though those things rid you of curses, they also drain the target's life force. Using them once shouldn't harm you too much, but if you try to use them excessively, your life may be at risk. Remembering all the situations in which he saw the magical eyes, the elf still asked our protagonist, You're not using them aware of this, right? Ronan's shocked expression had already given him away, and he commented that he didn't know about that because his intention was only to solve the curse problem once and for all. The elf understood the feelings that led him to this, but explained that the more haste he has, the greater the need to step back if something goes wrong. An irreversible outcome could occur, he signaled. Ronan listened seriously and took a minute to analyze everything. He looked at his tea, remembering what Professor Secret had said. This type of curse was difficult to cleanse, and several preparations would be necessary, even knowing that there was someone to help him. But after encountering that entity, Ronan felt the need to hurry. He picked up his sword, feeling it lighter in his hands, still thinking, If things went wrong, my life would have ended before even capturing that damn giant. Anyway, who is he? We also want to know who this mysterious elf who lived over 2,000 years ago would be. Ronan was still trying to remember who he was in his life, but he couldn't recall ever meeting him, although he seemed familiar. Ronan then picked up the cup, stating that he really thought he felt the need to hurry because of the religious fanatics walking around. The elf found the term religious fanatics strange, but Ronan confirmed that the term was correct, and they were those who awaited the advent of the stars and were shadowy and eccentric people. He sipped his tea calmly, while the elf had no words about it, but thought deeply about it. Fanatics who follow the stars, are they starting to move again? Night was already falling, and in the temple only a flame of fire was lit outside. The elf stood in front of the spiritual stone, thoughtful about the religious fanatics that Ronan had mentioned. If they were really the people he was thinking of, 
and if they were planning something malevolent, they would soon take innocent lives with a terrible calamity. This reminds us of the fields full of bodies from the first chapter. Sadness fell upon the elf because he would once again be forced to just watch. In his thoughts, the elf talked to his god, asking if this wasn't the case. Then would this child be the god's answer to him? What should I do? He asked before being interrupted by someone who asked, Are you awake, Sarante? And this someone was Ronan, who was wearing his pajamas and facing the situation with the elf, who then asked what he was doing awake at that hour, even thinking his bed might be uncomfortable. But our protagonist justified himself by saying he had just gone to drink some water. Then, he looked at the stone and said, Looking at this again, it's fascinating. A stone like this is the representation of God. Does it have any hidden meaning? The subject left the elf satisfied, and with an excited smile, he began his explanation. Of course, every thousand years, our order moves a thousand stones to the most remote area of the empire, the sanctuary of Kanja. This place always rains, and most stones don't last a hundred years and end up disappearing, carried away by the waters. But despite that, the stones that survive this thousand-year period and transcend this time to prove their worth receive the soul within them, and thus they become the representation of Seniel. The elf put his hand on his face, remembering the first time he participated in such a movement with his brothers, more than a thousand years ago. Ronan felt a little embarrassed by this attitude, finding it profound in many ways. Reflecting on the situation, Ronan still commented, Listening to it this way, it sounds like there were several priests. So how did you end up alone? The elf thought about his answer, affirming that everyone has their circumstances and that this work was more difficult than it may appear. He looked at the stone, casting a somber atmosphere around him, and we were taken to a memory, where he stated that devoting his entire life to a god who never responds. He emphasized that there were several moments when he also faltered, wanting to turn his back on his belief and live in freedom. In an even more serious tone, the elf said, However, a feeling always found me making me stay in this place. Seniel's will in this representation, one day, will become the first step to save the world. As the elf spoke all these words and how this kind of intuition is considered more of a faith, Ronan shivered at realizing why that elf was so familiar. He saw our dear commander in the aura of that elf, while he said that this kind of faith is not something that passes to anyone. He put his hand on Ronan's shoulders, affirming that he thought the moment was near, making him even more confident in his choice. The next day, they set aside what Sarante had said and officially began to reorganize. The special tea had also had several incredible effects on their group, and with the energy of Mana Veins, their sensitivity had greatly improved. While they conducted their meditations, Ronan helped Sorrente harvest roots as they traversed the mountains. Our protagonist was still intrigued by how kind Sorrente was to them, considering it was their first meeting, and how he could always sense truth in his heart in all his actions. As he continued to observe, this elf became even stranger to Ronan. Two peaceful days had passed, without much worry, but as always, tragedy lurks in the crevices to bring pain. Sounds reminiscent of a great catastrophe at the temple, Ronan covered in blood, gritted his teeth in anger and sorrow, his bloodied hand visible, and soon after, the elf sat lifeless, mirroring the scene from the first chapter with the commander, something that could not be forgotten by all. Ronan, kneeling before Sorrente, knew that at that moment it was already too late to turn back. However, that day had not yet come, and the beloved elf was bidding farewell to Ronan and his group. Sorrente was concerned if everything would truly be okay, as the cause of the monster's abnormal actions had not yet been found. He wanted the group to prepare a little longer, but Ronan Confident interrupted him, assuring that they would all be fine and emphasizing. You said only their actions are strange, but they haven't gotten stronger, Ronan assured, looking at his group that they were enough to handle them, and asked once again that he not worry. Each one responded in their own way. Ronan scratched his head with a sheepish smile, saying, Besides, the duration of the field trip is ending, so we need to return to school soon. The elf lowered his head, understanding that these situations don't leave much room for action, but soon after, he extended his hands, holding something shiny and golden, and asked for permission to give them a magic so they could return to the barrier, and with that, they were able to visit the temple freely. Sorrente raised his voice to truly emphasize that this was serious and said, If you feel you're in danger, don't hesitate to return immediately. Finally, he just asked for no one to let their guard down because even though they were strong, this forest was also deep and dark. Meanwhile, 
we were taken to the mentioned forest. It was indeed very dark, and apparently we caught a glimpse of the aftermath of a battle. There were several ogre and other creatures' bodies scattered on the ground, and the sound of footsteps of a being approaching grew louder. The bloodied sword appeared as the person continued. Hmm, this is going to be a little more troublesome. Another elf appeared in the form of a woman, revealing herself, and to think he would be so hard to find. Then, with these idiotic beasts, can I just get you out of there so easily? She was a beautiful elf with long hair, a yellow gaze, and wielded a sword. As we approached closer, she smiled sinisterly as she said, From now on, I will find you myself, Sarante. Some ogres seemed to have been possessed by something and were following that mysterious elf. On that same mountain where Sarante found Ronan and his friends, the day was very clear. The orcs were working to build their village. The group noticed that they were wearing clothes that humans used to wear and some jewelry that clearly wasn't theirs. It hinted that while they were away, they had looted a nearby village. Ronan turned to his friends and asked, Are you ready? Which didn't need to be answered. Barum replied with a smile, gripping his sword. Maria also held hers firmly, while Asil trembled but was sure he was ready. With a grim expression, Ronan stated, Let's go. Kill them all. Meanwhile, the orcs spoke in their own dialect. Crack, crack, that shiny looks good on you. The creature wearing a necklace around its neck claimed it was from a child in the village, and with a macabre smile added, That brat kept crying until he died. His voice was loud, it was even hard to... But everything was interrupted when Akel used his telekinesis to safely bring Barum and Maria to the location. The orcs found it all strange. Huh? They couldn't believe humans would be there. Barum and Maria's auras shone, their faces covered in rage. It didn't take long for two cuts to be seen, leaving their traces and blood dripping from those two orcs. They were both synchronized, starting to unleash several cuts with their swords. Only the glow of their mana was seen passing through several orcs in front of them. The situation was grim. The other creatures could only stand still watching their friends being cut in half. But rebellion came for some others, and with bright eyes and the atmosphere filled with anger, they confronted them. It didn't take long for several of them to move towards the two, leaving them surrounded. That was when a rock hit one of them directly, leaving the other one beside him incredulous. The struck orc fell to the ground, leaving the other one standing there not understanding until another rock hit him right in the head. Soon after, we see Acel being responsible for using his telekinesis on them, leading to the death of two orcs. Ronan smiled and clapped, saying, Wow, your precision is incredible. You've got the hang of it, haven't you? Acel struggled to keep everything under control, because he and Ronan were also under the effect of his ability. Together, following Ronan's command, Acel raised several rocks towards more orcs. Malevolently, finding it all amusing, Ronan shouted, Finish them off, leaving poor Aesil nervous. But soon Aesil's strength was displayed, and a loud rumble of rocks was heard, making all the orcs run in the opposite direction, though a strong explosion was seen next. After the impact, the smoke caused began to dissipate, and Aesil with a trembling voice said, Oh no, Ronan, I think I'm going to receive divine punishment for this later. Ahead of them, several orc bodies had been eliminated by Aesil's strong telekinetic power. Ronan put his hands on his friend's shoulders and asked him to calm down. With a smile on his face, he remarked, If we're going to be punished for something like this, we'll all receive it together. He turned to his friends and asked for confirmation of this statement, and Barum immediately agreed, saying he would always stand by his side and not to worry. But then he joked, But of course, you'll receive the biggest punishment. And comically, Asl burst into tears. Everyone started laughing, teasing each other, and Ronan reflected, they all had a chance to show their abilities in a real fight. So, it was worth coming to the mountains. Next time, I think I'll increase the difficulty. Suddenly, Sita placed her paw on Ronan's face, drawing his attention to something nearby. That's when they saw someone tied to a tree. Ronan and Aesil were surprised. What? They both exclaimed. They then discovered it was an elf who was being held captive. Both ran towards her. She was probably their emergency food, and they needed to save her. While Ronan tried to untie her, Saita devised a magical cure to minimize the damage. As the healing was being done, the elf slowly opened her eyes, a bit confused, and saw Ronan still blurry. Can I speak? She heard Ronan say. But a shock overcame her, making her widen her eyes. How? She exclaimed. 
The reason for her shock was the aura that surrounded the whole group. She then coughed, vomiting blood, which made her try to cover her mouth unsuccessfully. She leaned on Ronan to regain her strength, and that's when our protagonist realized that Sita's cure wasn't working for her. As soon as she recovered a bit, she mentioned to Ronan about the mana circulating among them and asked, Are you from the temple? Ronan's reaction was to inquire how she had an inkling of that, but the elf held him firmly and shouted, If so, please, please take me to it. Her expression was one of desperation as she continued to explain, They're coming. If we stay here too long, Sarante's life may be in danger. She barely managed to finish the sentence before fainting again, collapsing to the ground. Meanwhile, at the temple, Sarante was performing his duties when footsteps were heard beyond the magical barrier. Ronan ran towards him with the elf on his back, loudly calling out his name. Concerned, Sarante asked if something had happened or if there had been an accident for him to return so quickly, but the desperate young boy simply asked him to look at the woman first. He explained, She's a prisoner we rescued from the orc village. She said she needed to find you. A look of horror appeared on Sarante's face as he recognized the woman as Brigia, who was still unconscious on Ronan's back. Sarante extended his hands over her, channeling Mana, and asked what had happened. Meanwhile, at the seemingly empty camp, Maria and Barum were discussing how there was no one at the site, and how lucky they were that the elf was the only prisoner they found. Maria suggested going back to the temple as well, but she noticed Aesel kneeling in front of an orc body. She approached her friend and asked, What's wrong, Aesel? Is there something there? Aesel then replied, Well, there's something strange about these orcs. The three of them looked at the body and noticed something that wasn't there before. Aesel analyzed everything and realized they had concealed this information with double magic, noting that they all had a strangely golden symbol on their foreheads, and then asked, what does this magical circle do? If you enjoyed today's recap and want more Manhua content, subscribe to the channel. We're starting this journey now, and I hope that together we can strengthen this new community. So go ahead and like the video, comment for future parts, and share it with your friends. Thank you so much for joining us, and until next time.